we had been doing a few uh, books of the Bible. Mr. Newton had uh, almost, is almost finishing the book of uh, Ephesians and C. Um, Joy uh, had done the book of Galatians. And I think it's important that we focus seriously on the word of God and, uh, and uh, ask the Lord to open his word to us. So I thought that we would look into the book of Hebrews. The book of, book of Hebrews uh, sometimes is shrouded in mystery. Uh, there, is, there is a lot of theological uh, facts in that. And some people try to avoid that book because they feel it's too hard to understand. Nevertheless, it's a book which is very important for the Christian, and it's very important for a Christian life. It was not only to, the, to those who were, to whom it was written, but it is re very relevant for us today. So shall we look to the Lord and ask for his guidance? Lord, we come to you. We come to your feet, Lord. We pray that unless you open our eyes, Lord, our minds will not understand. Lord, unless you, you break the bread, Lord, we will not be fed. Lord, through the Holy Spirit, take and apply your word to our hearts. Open our hearts and minds that we may be able to see wonderful things from your word. Lord, speak to us and make it clear to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, I just want to um, give a brief overview of the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, um, even the early church fathers um, were not sure about uh, who wrote it and about its place in the Bible, in the word of, in the New Testament. When they gathered together the canon, uh, the book of Hebrews was took a long time to be accepted into the canon. And uh, because they were not sure, only because they were not sure who wrote the, the book, who wrote, was there a, a legitimate author behind it. And so it is said that it was tagged to the name of Paul. And because Paul was a recognized apostle, it was tagged to the name of Paul as the author, and therefore it uh, was accepted into the New Testament canon. To whom was it written? It was written to the second generation Jewish Christians in Rome. The first generation Jews, Jewish Christians who heard the apostles directly, many of them had passed away, and now the second generation of Jewish Christians were there, and it was addressed to them in Rome. When was it written? It was written sometime around AD 80, sometime around AD 80. Um, and the mystery or the essential question is, who wrote it? Oregon, one of the early church fathers said, who wrote the letter to the Hebrews only God knows for certain. Because it is not clear who wrote, and there were arguments for various people, but nobody can say definitely. Some believe that Paul wrote the epistle, but it is unlikely, because the style of the book of Hebrews is not like that of Paul. And also, Paul always identified himself in his epistles. He said, from Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the Christians in, in Rome or Ephesus or wherever. But here, the writer does not identify himself. And that is a bit unlike Paul. Tertullian, another church father, thought Barnabas wrote it. It is possible because Barnabas was a native of Cyprus, and the people of Cyprus spoke excellent Greek. 
This lecture was written in Greek, and the people of Cyprus spoke excellent Greek. Barnabas was a Levite, and therefore he would have had a good knowledge of the sacrificial and priestly system, which is referred to in detail, which is expounded in detail in, in this book of Hebrews. And Barnabas is also called the son of encouragement. And in the book of Hebrews, the letter to Hebrews is termed, the author terms it as a word of encouragement. And there are a lot of encouragement in the book of Hebrews. So some believe it was Barnabas who wrote this book. Luther thought that Apollos wrote it. Apollos was a Jew who was born in Alexandria. Therefore, he knew Greek very well. He was an eloquent man, and he was well-versed in the Old Testament scriptures. Yet, so there are controversies, and, and uh, Oregon may be, may be right when he said, who wrote the letter to the Hebrews? Only God knows for certain. Why was this letter written? Why was it written? The context was these second generation Jewish Christians were going through difficult times. They had faced persecution in the past, uh, which we read about in chapter 10 and verses 32 to 34. Um, the writer says, The writer says, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulation. And for you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession. So these Christians had already endured some persecution, but as the writer says, you have not endured up to the point of death. Maybe they were not killed as, as the usually the Christians had to face death. So they had some, faced some persecution, and now the threat of more persecution was imminent. It was in the air, it was just going to come. The first persecution was in the time of Nero, around AD 64, and we know about Nero. Then this, but the more severe persecution happened in the time of Domitian, the Emperor Domitian, which was around AD 85. And this letter was written in the period in between. So people were expecting, aware that there will be a great persecution, and so this letter was written around AD 80. So these Jewish, to these Jewish Christians, um, the thought of persecution would have discouraged some. They, were thought, they thought of going back to Judaism. Why Judaism? Because the Romans knew that the Jews will never bow down and worship the emperor. They knew that they had only one God and they would only worship one God. So the Romans gave them an exception. The Jewish, the Jews and Judaism, they gave them an exception. They left them alone. They didn't persecute them because they didn't worship the emperor. But then this new sect of Christians, who were they, what were they, in the beginning, they were identified with the Jews, Jewish religion and Judaism. But later on, as it grew, the Romans were, knew that this was not a sect of Judaism. So they started persecuting these Christians, the church which was growing in large numbers. And so by going back to Judaism, these new Jewish Christians would escape persecution. Whereas if they remained in the Christian church, they would face severe persecution. So that is why these Jewish Christians, new Christians, were, were tempted to go back to Judaism. After all, you know, the temple was still there, the worship and the Jewish uh, sacrifice, sacrificial system was still there, and they were all still relevant for them. 
and why not go back to the Juda to Judaistic religion? So it was written to encourage them to stand firm. A brief outline of the book. If we go through the book, uh, we see that the word better <coughs> comes many times. The writer is arguing to these Jewish Christians from their knowledge of the Jewish faith, of, of the law, that Jesus Christ is better than angels. Why does he bring up the angels here? Because the Jews believe that the law was handed over to them by angels. It, I mean, it came through God, spoke to Moses, but it was handed over by angels. And Stephen makes mention of that in his speech of defense. Jesus is better than Moses and the Mosaic law. Jesus is better than the Aaronic high priesthood. For he belong, he is a high priest, but he doesn't belong to the Aaronic high priesthood. He belongs to a superior order, that of the order of Melchizedek. Jesus established a better covenant where the law of God was written in the hearts of people. He has entered into a better sanctuary. The Old Testament priests ministered in a sanctuary which was built with hands, and that sanctuary was soon going to be destroyed. But Jesus entered into a sanctuary not made with hands, not built with hands. The sacrifice of the Lord Jesus was better than the Old Testament sacrifices. The Old Testament animal sacrifices could never take away sin, and it had to be repeated again and again. Even though it was offered, it was not effective to, t to be effective once and for all. It had to be repeated. And the guilt of the sinner was not cleansed. He was only made ceremonially clean. But the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus was done once and for all. It was by his own body, by his own blood, he shed on the cross. And so he offered a much better sacrifice which could cleanse the heart of the sinner. Then we have these great examples of faith and, uh, and the encouragement and to therefore endure in faith looking unto Jesus. So briefly, this is a brief outline to the book of Hebrews. Certain words are used repeatedly in this epistle, especially the Greek form of these words are used repeatedly. And when a word is used repeatedly, it means there is, the writer is giving importance to those, to that word or to that idea. He says, better is used 13 times in the Greek, Greek uh, version. Jesus Christ is better than angels. He brought in a better hope. He's a mediator of a better covenant, he, and he's, which is established on better promises. So the word better occurs many times in this epistle. Perfect, the Greek word for perfect is used 14 times, and it means a perfect standing before God. This perfection could never be accomplished by Levitical priesthood or by the law. Animal sacrifices could not achieve this per perfection. Again, the word is used that Jesus Christ gave himself as one offering for sin, and by this he has perfected forever those that are sanctified. Again, the next word is eternal or forever. The, the root word is the same in Hebrew, in Greek, that Christ is the author of eternal salvation, that eternal lasting forever. Through his death, he obtained eternal redemption. He shares with believers the promise of eternal inheritance. 
His throne is forever. In Greek, it means eternal. He is a priest forever, without beginning or end. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is eternally the same. So the word eternal is repeated many times. The author gives several warnings in, the, in this book, but there are five important warnings. Firstly, the warning of drift of neglecting the word, neglecting the word. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, Uh, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? He doesn't say if we reject deliberately, if we neglect Neglecting is you know the word, you know the truth, but you just are not bothered to finish it and you drift away. Drifting is not a sudden process, it's a slow process. A boat which is anchored by the river or by the sea, if the, if the tie rope is loose, it drifts and it drifts slowly and slowly and slowly and is then found far away. The second warning is doubting the word that is having a hard heart. In chapter 3, verse 7, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the days of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Warning against hardening Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So a warning against hardening the heart. Jesus spoke a parable of the seeds, the sower, and the seed which fell on the path. The ground was so hard that there was no way the, seed, the root could penetrate the ground. Warning against hardening the heart. Third warning is dullness towards the word or sluggishness. Dullness or sluggishness. In chapter 5, verse 11, of whom you have, we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. So these people, some of them had become dull of hearing, dullness when comes when we are not interested in it anymore, when the word is no longer real to us, when other things are more attractive to us than the, wor than the word of God then dullness comes. And there's a warning towards dullness or sluggishness. Fourthly, there's a warning against despising the word or willfully rejecting the word. Despising or willfully rejecting the word. In chapter 10 and verse 26, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation. So willfully rejecting, deliberately rejecting the word of God. 
Finally, the warning defying the word, defying is refusing, rejecting and refusing to hear, refusing to hear the word. In chapter 12 and verse 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. So refusing to hear this and this root of bitterness which springs up and, and, uh, and then prevents us from responding to the word. So the book, writer to the book of Hebrews gives many warnings, but chiefly these five important warnings, drifting, doubting, dullness, despising, and defying the word. He also gives many exhortations or encouragements to the Hebrew Christians. And I just want to go through some of these. Most of them, the word therefore, happens many times in this book of Hebrews. Therefore, when we say therefore, we have, there, it is connecting with two parts. One, because we have a nice church here, therefore, let us meet here for our services. So it's the word therefore connects one truth to the other. And the this word therefore is repeated many times. And the writer, after, uh, after giving his arguments, is saying, therefore, we must give the more er earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. We have to give more careful attention to what we have heard. He is talking about Jesus being, being the, the, the son, the exact representation of God, the exact image of God. And then he says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. The next one in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, who appointed him. Therefore, brethren, who have shared in this heavenly calling, consider this apostle and high priest, consider the Lord Jesus Christ, who was faithful in his, to God, in what he was ordained to do. Therefore, consider the Lord Jesus. When we are discouraged, when our eyes turn away from the Lord Jesus, we may have to turn back to the Lord Jesus. Consider the Lord Jesus who was faithful and turn our eyes on him. Then the next exhortation in chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Today if you will hear his voice, do not Harden your hearts. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, an exhortation not to harden our hearts. When do our hearts become hardened? When we are not in touch with a living relationship with the Lord Jesus. We were once upon a time in touch, but slowly we have drifted away. Slowly the word of God is less and less important. We, we, we do not sit at the feet of the Lord uh, as we used to go, do before. We neglect our times with God and then slowly we harden our hearts. And the, uh, and the writer to the Hebrews says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. In chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear 
lest any of you seem to have come short of it. In chapter 4, the writer is speaking about the rest which Jesus offers. And he's arguing that, that although God had told his people that I will give you rest, but Joshua led them into the promised land. But that was not the real rest. The real rest is in the Lord Jesus. And it is when we submit our lives and surrender our lives to him. And therefore, he's warning these Jewish Christians who were sent, tempted to go back. Since there is a promise, God, the Lord has promised a true rest, a heavenly rest. Let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of it. The third, the other exhortation, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of dis disobedience. Again, be diligent to enter that rest. Then he exhorts the, the readers, let us hold fast to our confession. Let us hold fast to our faith. Let us hold fast to what we have professed. In chapter 4, verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We are not holding fast to an empty confession, to an empty hope, to an empty promise, but it is because we have a living Savior, we have a great high priest, and he has passed through the heavens before us. He has made a way for us into the heavens. He has blazed the trail for us. And therefore, let us hold fast to him. Let us hold fast to our faith. Let us hold fast to our confession. Then he says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Come boldly through the throne of grace. Verse 16 of chapter 4, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because Jesus has gone before us, because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, because Jesus is a living Savior, therefore let us boldly come to him where we may obtain in the time of temptation, in the time of difficulties, in the time of trials and doubts, let us boldly come to the throne of grace. And then a very important uh, exhortation that let us, in chapter 6, verse 1, let, therefore leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. These Jewish Christians, have, they had received the word, they had received a mature adult teaching, but because they had gone away, they were not ready to receive solid food. They still they still needed milk to be fed with milk. And therefore the writer is saying, let us not go back to the foundations again and again, but let us move forward, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles, principles of maybe sin and, and surrender and following the Lord, leaving the elementary principles, let us go on to perfection, to sanctification, to, to being like the Lord Jesus, to, to serving him and dying for him. So let us leave the elementary principles and go on to perfection. And finally, let us therefore, brethren, by having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, 
having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. So he's again urging his readers to move forward. Let us, since we have the boldness through the Lord Jesus to enter into the Holy of Holies, the, Jude the, the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament temple, only the high priest could enter once a year. But here as believers, we can enter at any time into the presence of God. So he says, because we have this privilege, let us draw near with a sincere and true heart in full assurance of faith, with a cleansed heart, a heart that is cleansed from an evil conscience. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but exhorting one another. So this is a, another exhortation. Let us not neglect our meeting together. Let us not neglect fellowship. Let us not, let us not lose heart and drift away but let us encourage one another. And that is the purpose of a body of believers. And then the familiar verse, which we are all familiar chapters, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the, the author and finisher of our faith. Since we, are, we have, having spoken about all the great heroes of faith, some had big, big, great victories, but some God chose they had to suffer and die. But they were all heroes, and they were all precious in the sight of God. And he says, the author is encouraging his Christians, his uh, followers, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, everything that hinders us from following the Lord closely. Let us lay, put it away and let us run with patience and endurance the life, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. And then as a continuation, he says, therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. Encourage one another, strengthen one another to look to the Lord Jesus and follow him. And then in chapter 12, verse 28, therefore since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Since we have a hope, and we have a hope of eternal life, we have a hope of sharing in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. We have the hope of reigning with the Lord Jesus when he comes again. So let us serve God with reverence and fear. Let us be faithful now so that we do not miss our our future hope and inheritance. And finally, the last therefore, is a very meaningful therefore in chapter 13 and, um, and verse 13. Therefore, in verse 12, therefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate, therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, for here we have no continuing city. The, the reference is, you know, the high priest on the Day of Atonement, there were two goats, one goat, he laid his hands on both the goats and confessed the sin of the nation and his own sin, and then one goat was sacrificed, the other goat was led far away, outside the camp of the Israelites, led far, far away. And he says, Jesus had no place in the city. He had no place of honor to die an honorable death. He had no place to be buried in an honorable tomb inside the city. He 
was, he was rejected, and he, it was a shameful thing to die outside, to be crucified outside. But because Jesus himself suffered outside the gate, suffered outside, he was rejected. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Let us know that we have no lasting city, that this glories of this life is not ours. They will not last. Let us go outside the camp and suffer with him and bear, bearing his shame and reproach. This letter has a lot of significance for us. We may think why we are, life is going on very comfortably. We do not think that there will be you know, an Emperor Nero or Emperor Domitian. Of course, we hear about some churches being broken and all that here and there. But on the whole, our lives are secure. But I believe we have to remember that difficult times may come. We do not know. We, none of us imagined the, the spectrum of change and destruction that COVID brought. We never dreamt of that. We do not know what the future will hold. If God spares us from persecution, well and well, good, we will live for him. But may we be ready to face persecution. May, we, may God give us the grace to stand firm, even in the time of persecution, even in the time of loss, or even if we have to sacrifice our lives. Let, us be, let this book encourage us to be faithful to him in hard times. Shall we pray? O oh Lord, you have given us your words to, to teach us, to warn us, to encourage us, Lord, and to build us up. O oh Lord, speak to us through your word. Make your word alive and meaningful to our hearts. And Lord, help us to take heed to your warnings and help us to walk with you in the ways that you call us to, Lord. Thank you for being with us, Lord. You are our, our hope. You are our Savior, your Lord and Master. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.